welcome to this very special episode of Heterodox History. Today we are going to be discussing the history of Armenia and to preemptively stop anyone who's going to <laughs> uh, mock my title of a brief history. Yes, we are going to cover over 30 centuries of history in this lecture. However, to do so in around two hours is brief, regardless. <laughs> anyway, I'm very lucky to be joined by Furious Pertinax. Hello. Hello and good morning, everyone. Glad we could, uh, everyone could be here and glad to be on. It's a very interesting subject. Sadly, I don't know a whole lot about Armenia, hence our guest for today. But uh, if anyone who is a student of, you know, uh, classical Hellenic history or Roman history or indeed Byzantine history and history of, uh, pertaining to the Crusades, uh, and even to some degree the foundations of Christianity um, exist within the Armenian sort of uh, backstory in Armenian historiography itself and uh, uh, you know Armenia is an interesting place and is, has a fundamental part in that so I'm glad we've got uh, uh, our guest on board with us to really delve into those subjects. And our guest for today is good day I'm very pleased to have you on uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure um, I'm Gudea so I'm the creator of the two channels the Gudea Total War channel where I talk about um, mostly the historical total war video games and how they connect with history the portrayals of history the gamification of history and the importance of that um, on that channel and i also have another channel gudea the historian that's rather new doesn't have too much content but it will be where i post um, videos that are more about um, history just straight history and uh, i'm a mesopotamianist by training but uh, I also have, I grew up in the Armenian community. I have an education in Armenian history. I uh, did some of my graduate work in Armenia itself as well. So, um, and I also studied classical Armenian too. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be on the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. So why Armenia? Why are we discussing Armenia today? Well. As people will know who've been watching this channel, we've just been covering a lot of Ottoman history and a lot of Russian history. We have orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. At one point, Marcus and I, two points actually, Marcus and I have gone away and uh, I have delivered a brief presentation on the history of Ukraine. And later, Marcus and I teamed up to do a retrospective on Cossack history as well. Now, where to put Armenian history into all of this? Because, of course, Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality is a history of the Byzantine Christian Commonwealth and later Orthodoxy itself, the Second Rome in Constantinople, moving to the Third Rome in Moscow. Armenia doesn't really neatly fit into this, and yet Armenian history is a cost of great shadow across this entire period and, of course, throughout all of antiquity, moving into modern day. But why should we study the history of Armenia today? Because objectively, looking at this map, Armenia is the country in the middle for people who can actually place it on a map, past the Caucasus. This is eastern Turkey, northern Iran. You can see little bits of Syria, Iraq. Uh, Azerbaijan actually intersects Azerbaijan in two ways. There's a little Azerbaijani enclave to the west of Armenia, whilst in the red area on the right is uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a region which is currently effectively under the control of Armenian separatists, albeit there's a lot of political maneuvering and military action going on, even as we speak regarding the Azerbaijani control yes. over the Lachin Corridor, which connects uh, Nagorno-Karabakh with the rest of Armenia. However, just looking at this map in particular, this is a ethnic density map. And this pertained to the era just before World War I. So as you can see, there is a significant Armenian population in Eastern Anatolia and a significant Armenian population throughout all of the Caucasus as well. And this is because this is very much a truncated Armenia, the Armenia we see today. Um, there are around in excess of 10 million Armenians in the world today and only around 2.8 million of them actually live in the modern day state of Armenia. There's a huge Armenian expat community in Russia, a large one in the United States. I believe you're talking to us from uh, California today, uh, Gudea. Yes. And of course, uh, a large one in France and smaller ones in Iran and of course, Azerbaijan and other places around the world. Um, and why is this the case? Well, this is a truncated Armenia. You can say Armenia is the victim of history. 
And this is the map which is going to be very useful in terms of sort of informing our understanding of the continuous nature of Armenian statehood today. This is a map by uh, a liberal politician in the early 20th century, uh, Lynch, uh, a liberal politician who served under Campbell Bannerman and Asquith and wrote a popular history of the Armenians at the beginning of the 20th century. The Armenian plateau, it forms a natural border, but not in the sense that I've used the term natural border as with French revolutionary France, which is to refer to this imagined conception of the ancient borders of antiquity. Rather, these are real natural borders in the sense that these territories have by and large been occupied by the same people for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And it's, retained... it's, it's worth saying probably that it's a, it's a geographical reality as well as a, a sort of an ethnographic reality at one time. Yes, it's a, it's a national, ethnic, cultural and geographic reality and meant, mm -hmm. well, existed up until uh, 1917, especially. Um, exactly. And there was even an attempt to revive, uh, revive this idea after the Armenian genocide post-1917. And of course, this appeals to slightly larger areas in the east, you know, going over to uh, uh, Tbilisi, into Iran, um, incorporating much of modern day uh, Kurdistan that exists within Anatolia, etc. And even, you know, extending to uh, Trabzon or Trebizond, where there was a large Armenian population as well. So this isn't insignificant. And if you think about this in terms of the uh, geography of the Near East, so including Mesopotamia, including Iraq, including Syria, including Eastern Anatolia, including the Caucasus, including Iran, then you could very much say, given the fact that these are the Armenian highlands, uh, this is a very rugged mountainous territory, in fact, you know, with prominent mountains such as Mount Ararat, um, Armenia had the potential to effectively be the Switzerland of the Near East. And what is remarkable about Armenia is that it has a twin in Africa uh, with Ethiopia as well another oriental orthodox society which has been hemmed in by islamic powers uh, parts of it have been conquered but the civilization in part has endured the exception being however with ethiopia is that ethiopia despite being conquered by the italians in the 1930s actually expanded and survived in a large form to this day whereas armenia did not win has been defeated and has been truncated ever since. I think, again, the only other comparison I can think of in terms of such a long-lived people that have existed throughout antiquity from the Bronze Age collapse up until today, where there is a large national diaspora and a tiny homeland, you could possibly refer to this again, with a uh, uh, modern day state of Israel, albeit Zionism is a different beast entirely. And I don't really want to sort of run deep into that comparison, especially with the Armenian genocide. But um, nevertheless, this map will inform us in terms of thinking about a continuous Armenian state, which has existed since the Bronze Age collapse all the way up until the 20th century. And this is another reason why I really want to discuss Armenia today, because Armenia, despite being forced into a state of subjugation, despite being conquered over and over again, it has often resurfaced. Uh, reconsolidated into a new territorial unit based on this territory of the Armenian plateau and have survived. In fact, Marcus, can you really think of that many nations that have existed since antiquity um, in a similar sort of ethnic and linguistic form with a territorial basis like this and have survived and be able to recreate themselves so often as Armenia has? Uh, probably not. The only nation that I can think that has endured, and certainly not as long, but if you think about a, a people, a, 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 you know, an identifiable people, a distinguish, a distri distinguishable people and culture, you might sort of think once the fusion between, say, the Gallo-Romans and the Franks complete, or at least it is, uh, uh, is underway in uh, you know after the conquest of of the of the clovers but but you have then... to think though um marcus with that comparison because to mm. emphasize a lot of this happened after the fall of the western oh, roman empire but, but that, um, that's, that's my point it's like half the length of time compared to armenia exactly <laughs> Maybe less. we're talking about the you sixth know. century as opposed to the mm. sixth century bc correct we begin to see yes. references to armenia in greek for the first time Mm, exactly right. I mean, p potentially uh, the Hellenes might be a, a good comparison, or if uh, I, I mean, I know well, I, I would as say, well that the... I've been thinking about this before coming on as to whether the Hellenes would be a good comparison, and the mm. reason I push back against that is that Hellenic civilization never consolidated into a nation state like Armenia did with Correct. definitive boundary under a king. Mm. 
it only was able to establish he temporary hegemonship, say, for example, under the Argea dynasty of Philip mm -hmm. and later Alexander the Great. But even mm -hmm. they didn't have conclusive control over Greece. The Greeks were notorious for infighting and their whole system of colonia and the city-states. But yes. even then, because you're the Byzantists, you're the, you're the Byzantists, the mm. Greek civilization was recontextualized away from being Greeks, away from being Hellens, into being Romaioi, into being Romans. Correct. And this similar shift doesn't happen when we have the Armenian conquest by the Arabs in the mm. 7th century AD. They remain mm. Armenians and they remain Armenians to this day. Whereas going back to the war of Greek independence, the Greeks had to reimagine a Hellenic identity. They had to Correct. reintroduce it through the works of Adamantus uh, Carius. And, um, and, where, and, and somewhere where you and I would perhaps um, sort of feel there's a disjointing from is the fact that a lot of those uh, proponents of Greek independence from the Ottomans dispensed with a, a almost a, a thousand year block of Greek history, which included the Byzantine Eastern Empire. It was a hearkening back to a, a Hellenism of antiquity. Of, cl of of classic of classical Greece, rather than a continuation or, or an evolution or rebirth of medieval Greece. So and there's this, also uh, that point. And this brings in another I idea with it as well, which is that Armenia was the first state, the first kingdom, to convert to Christianity. I, I believe thirteen, uh, twelve years and three hundred and one A.D. Twelve years before the Edict of Milan, and long mm. before Constantine would eventually convert to Christianity. So Armenia is not only the first Christian state, but Armenia also retains this distinct Christian identity, despite mm. being regularly conquered not only by uh, people who oppose the Armenian Apostolic Church. The, um, the Byzantines in particular being Orthodox, uh, but also Shia Muslims in the East and Sunni Muslims in the West. So again, it's retaining and, and, this... and prior to Islam, the, the Zoroastrians under the under the aegis of the Sassanids tried their best to sort of stamp that out as well. They attempted to convert the Armenians more than once. And the Armenians actually fought very bravely against the Persians to uh, resist that happening. Uh, Gadea, before we get into the sort of broad chronology, is there anything you want to pick up in general about Armenia? You've been very quiet. Oh, well, I think um, your introduction was uh, quite quite good, and especially this map. I think this map, even though it's not necessarily what you might call a scientific map, when you're talking about 3,000 years of history, like you said, it's it's a very good sort of visual representation of the broad geographic region um, we're talking about. And of course, it also ties into um, modern conflicts, conflicts to this day, which have not been resolved uh, for the past hundred years that are also connected to the Armenian genocide as well. And um, uh, yeah, but I, uh, yeah. I think this is so in, in terms of how to really start this off and uh, get into the sort of thrust of the conversation. Um, there are many sort of elements I want to bring up, especially regarding what, what I do at the beginning of these series, uh, which is looking into the linguistic sort of uh, origins of various nations, because, you know, um, deep down, I'm very much a very amateurish uh, philologist. But um, one can't help but look to the it's not even part of Armenia today, unfortunately. It's part of uh, Turkey, technically, but it's on the border with Armenia, which is Mount Ararat. Of course, yes. uh, people who are familiar with Genesis will know that Mount Ararat is the final resting place, supposedly, of Noah's Ark. And this is the beginning of the biblical consecration of nations in the sense that Noah is the father of nations. And as part of the table of nations of the various sons of Noah, if we look in particular at Japheth, and the, the nations of the north. One of his descendants is Hayek. And later, I believe this was um, part of a, what, a seventh century history. Um, I, I forget, I think it was uh, Moses of uh, Karen right, um, right. who wrote the primary history of the Armenians, one of many sort of Armenian histories which we might get into uh, after the Christianization. So in many ways you can say that the, the Hayek myth was also attempts to synthesize elements of paganism with elements of the uh, Abrahamic tradition as if to give it both a Christian and a paganistic origin in the form of Armenia. But from Hayek we get the modern 
nation of Armenia, the modern sort of creation of the name, which is Hayastan, and what the Armenians refer to themselves as Hay, where of course from Greek and Latin we have the word Armenia, and there's a very contentious element of where we get the etymology of Armenia. If we go to the biblical sources and say from Hayek, we get the Armenian etymology. There is also Aram, who is a descendant of Hayek. But again, I, I don't believe in this at all because Aram is supposed to be the founder of the Aramanian dynasty or the Aramanian peoples. If you look at this map, uh, I believe uh, the Aramanians, Marcus, would have been a people operating around Osrahen or the area around Edessa, uh, Kahe, just east of the Euphrates, where modern-day mm -hmm. um, Aleppo is, between uh, what is now sort of Kurdistan and the greater Armenian highlands. Uh, I'll, so I'll, I would say I would call it the the western sort of fringes of what we describe as Assyria or modern-day Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. right. However, mm -hmm. there is there is um, a very old link to the kingdom of Arme. Arme is both a, a kingdom's name, but is also the name of one of the first kings of a nation, a proto-Armenian nation called Uratu, which I believe is the Assyrian name for Mount Arawat, hence why I've got up here Uratu and right. Ararat at the same time. Um, so in that sense, there is a natural definition of a natural sort of tangible place and person in the form of Arme, which can help to give this definition. But I also just want to look up, because you mentioned, uh, Gudea, that you were a uh, a historian of Mesopotamia. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the link between Hayek and his Assyrian counterpart in the form of Asher? Um, in particular, the legend that Hayek was responsible for killing Belus, the god king of Babylon, or uh, there's another, I believe there's another sort of link with him killing Nimrod, who in the Bible is responsible for the creation of the Tower of Babel, whilst Asher in Assyria is responsible. He's also demonstrated as the winged son a very iconic image throughout uh, the East, who was responsible for slaying Tiamat. Yes, clearly, I think um, <clears throat> the account in Moses of Choren, where Haik slays uh, Bel, the king or god of Babylon. Of course, Bel in Babylonian just means lord. And in the Neo-Babylonian period, especially, it was utilized to refer to Marduk, the chief god of uh, Babylon, even though the term itself is just uh, Bel. Um, but, uh, and that story is definitely sort of uh, an echo of uh, the struggle between the Urartians and the, the people living in the Armenian highlands with the Mesopotamian empires in the second millennium to into the first millennium, for sure. There are a lot of echoes of really ancient history in Moses of Choren that have been, you could say, corrupted, though I don't like the term corrupted. It makes it sound like it has no meaning to me. Um, but there are a lot of echoes of that ancient history there in Moses of Choren, who's a 5th century AD historian, um, actually in the English translation by uh, Thompson of the history of the Armenians by Moses uh, Horenazi, he redates the history to um, the eighth century due to the utilization of uh, certain place names that are um, given later, like Vaspuragan, right, which come later on in medieval history. Um, however, uh, I'd say more um, a lot of modern historians like to say that they are both right, both of those interpretations, because there are clearly uh, later scribes who are copying things down and adding things to the text. And that's where you get the later references. But the original history is from the fifth century. And going back to the topic of the etymology of Armenia. So actually, the first time we see the term Armenia is in the Behistun inscription of King Darius I in the late 6th century BC, right? And uh, in the Behistun inscription, which of course um, is a trilingual inscription, uh, though of course we also have a partial Aramaic version as well from papyri found at Elephantini uh, in southern Egypt. Uh, in the Behistun inscription, in the Elamite version, we have Harminu Yap for the term Armenia, referring to this uh, geographic region. In 
the Babylonian version or Akkadian version, we have um, Urartu. And in Persian, we have Armenia. And in Aramaic, we have RRT. So Ararat again. So from that, we can garner that in the Semitic tradition. They use the term Ararat or Urartu, which is the uh, just the Babylonian or Assyrian version of Ararat. And uh, in the Aramaic as well, we have Ararat. And then in the Persian tradition, we have Armina, so the non-Semitic tradition. Uh, the Elamite version, probably influenced from the Persian, uh, has Harminu Yap, though word initial H is not pronounced in Elamite. So just Armenia probably would be the pronunciation of that Armeniap being the Elamite plural. Um, but in any case, a hike, so high, you have that root. This is the name of Armenia in Armenian, right? Hike, with Armenia being the exonym. Uh, so high is that root, and then the k is just classical Armenian plural, much like the Elamite version having the plural slapped onto the end. Our, the k is just a plural. Um, and a lot of people have connected this name, Hai, to an, a Hittite uh, place name. So the Hittites uh, talk about a kingdom to the east of them called uh, Hayasha or Hayasa. Uh, they write using cuneiform, so the cuneiform signs they use indicate pronunciation Hayasha. And um, that kingdom is somewhere probably where eventually in the Hellenistic period we see Armenia Minor, where <clears throat> Ani Kamach is. Um, and uh, a lot of people connect the term high and hike to that kingdom, uh, though, of course, we don't have really enough data from that kingdom itself or f even from the names given by the Hittites because they give us some uh, place names and some king names, but they, they don't seem to be uh, much connected to Armenian, or at least not at first glance. But, uh, yeah, there's my spiel about the origins of the names. Well, thank you very much for that, Gudea. Just to to sort of emphasize some of the points you made, um, Hayasa would have been, Hayasha would have been the equivalent of a march of the Hittite Empire because the Hittites mainly focused on what is now northern Syria, central Anatolia. Um, of course, going as far as western Anatolia in parts, and interestingly, on another episode on this channel, uh, Semyogog and I have been talking about the attempts of uh, the Sun language theory and uh, Turkish Anatolian nationalists within the 20th century to try and recontextualize yes. the Hittites as being Turkish. Anyway, uh, right. moving on from right. that. The Urartians um, as well. Yes. In a lot of ways. Uh, well, again, the whole point of this association with Aratians and Hittites being Turkish is to give the Turkish nation a identity which predates that of the Armenians so as to justify the Armenians which, no longer living in places in eastern Anatolia. Which which uh, I would I would say to anyone who's listening and who has the inclination to do so, um, it, is, it is still worth going to the Anatolian Civilization Museum in um, Ankara if you have the chance to, because you're quite you're quite right, both of you, about the framing of it. Uh, you know, trying to connect, you know, you might say a Turkish uh, identity or a Turkish heritage that predates the Seljuk incursions of the 11th century, um, and how that's try that how that attempts to be sort of shall I say intertwined or interwoven within the narrative story of the of the modern state is actually quite intriguing. Just um, a point, though, on the, the etymology of Hayasha. Obviously, if we look at the language of Aratu, it, uh, one of the, again, fascinating things about Armenia, which I want to bring up, and one of the reasons why we really should study it today, is the fact that Armenian hasn't got really any other connection in terms of any other language group. Um, there was, I, I believe this is fundamentally discredited, this really dates back to Herodotus, 
who tried to link um, Phrygia, which is an area in Western Anatolia, uh, to the Armenians as a possible origin and a possible link between um, the Armenian and I believe at one point even the Albanian language um, to the language of Armenia. Um, there has also been another hypothesis, which actually it's a relatively recent hypothesis uh, pioneered by um, Ivanov and Grohl since the 1980s, uh, which is the Armenian heartland hypothesis, which suggests that the origins of the Indo-European peoples and languages isn't, as we conventionally know, in the Pontic steppe, but is instead in the Armenian highlands. <laughs> of, um, of course, I'm not qualified to be able to justify whether that is the case or not, just to point out that quite a few scholars have actually come along to that view rather recently as opposed to the conventional setting of the Pontic steppe and my own sort of uh, sort of mythic sort of conception of this I, I rather like this viewpoint simply for the fact that we can link Genesis the Table of Nations and Mount Ararat to the foundation of Indo-European civilization as sort of recorded in the Bible um, and of course uh, Marcus before we were coming on uh, you were mentioning the Caucasian link and the Caucasian people having a place mm. name which actually links them to this region, even though Ararat is just slightly west of the Caucasus, nevertheless, uh, peripherally, it is closer to the Caucasus mountain ranges as compared to uh, the greater Pontic steppe, which is north of north and east of Crimea. Indeed, indeed. Just sort of one point before we move on quickly, you did use the word Albanian here. Now, just for those who are listening, uh, oh, yes. terms, it's going to be very confusing. Iberians, yeah, yeah. Albanians, Colchis. Yes, yes. So, so for those who don't know that, obviously there's the Monday nation state of Albania, which is located in the southwest Balkans. And then also there's Iberia, as in the Iberian Peninsula, which contains Portugal and Spain. However, it is worth mentioning that, uh, shall I say, in the pre-medieval period, Albania and Iberia are used as place names for regions which exist uh, east of modern-day Armenia between it and the... Uh, Caspian Sea so don't get confused by that because oftentimes people do find it head scratching when they come across it. So good day you mentioned the first inscription by Darius in the late 6th century where we get the yeah. term Armenia from uh, but obviously there are several civilizations which have existed in this region before we get to Armenia. Um, one of the other links I wanted to draw on, which is, of course, we mentioned the Hittite, is actually going a little earlier than that and looking at the Hurrians, um, a people which are seldom mentioned but operated around uh, the kingdom was called Mitanni in what is now Kurdistan, but is really the area between eastern Syria and northwestern Iraq. Uh, just south of uh, Anatolia and encompassing various parts of it. Um, I believe there was a self descriptor uh, within the Hurin language um, which referred to them as Hadi. So, again, just a distinct sort of link sort of back to Hai in terms of all of these uh, similar descriptors. But the reason I bring up the Hurrians is as with the Iratu language, these languages are now extinct. So how do we get from the Hurrian peoples, the Hittites, and any sort of would-be influences via the Assyrians, etc., the Neo-Babylonians, the Mesopotamian empires, how do we get from that to a nation which speaks proto-old uh, old Armenian before we get to the classical Armenian um, in the first century AD, effectively, to the point where not only do we have a language and scripture for it, but we also have a satrapy which is called Armenia, which has been designated by the Archimedes when they encroach upon this territory in the 7th and 6th centuries BC? That's an extremely good question. And this has to do with the cohabiting of different peoples in the same region for a, a long period of time and mutual influence between each other. So we have a similar case. Now, my strength was a third millennium Mesopotamian history. Um, that's what I did my thesis on. And uh, the, in the early period where when we just get the start of historical writing and royal inscriptions in the 27th century BC, 26th century BC, and we get texts in Sumerian that sort of describe their situation and kings doing kingly things, uh, we can already see from the language that 
there is a significant Akkadian influence, Semitic influence, on Sumerian, and vice versa. We have significant Sumerian influence on Akkadian. So we have loan words from both languages into each other's languages. For example, Wardu is the Akkadian word for slave, and in Sumerian it's Arad, which comes from the Akkadian. And then same thing, Akkadian has several loan words from Sumerian, like um, uh, Ekalu comes from Egal, Sumerian for palace, but there are tons of them. But uh, I just want to make this connection here. In the, in the ancient world, uh, a lot of the time we have very diverse, diversely populated regions, um, like early Mesopotamia, and uh, of course going throughout Mesopotamian history, it's diversely pop populated. Um, even to the Hittite kingdom, to Mitanni, right, where you have a nobility that speaks Indo-European and in Indo-European language, but the people are Hurrian and their culture is Hurrian. Or, and then you have, you know, the Hittites, where there are so many different local cultures, the Palaic, the Palaic speakers, the Khatic people, who are, an, it's another linguistic isolate, right? Um, and uh, several other groups there as well. Um, there's a good example I like to mention. Uh, one of the kings of the Hittites, uh, Murshili, I can't remember which one, um, when he, I believe the, the fourth, when he is deposed and escapes to Egypt, we have a letter from the later Hittite king to the Egyptian pharaoh uh, asking them to give him up. And in that letter, they use his personal name, which is a Hurrian name, not a Hittite name which has a lot of implications in terms of the eth his ethnicity. Why is his regnal name Hittite, but his personal name uh, Hurrian? Same thing in Urartu and then later uh, Armenia. Though, of course, again, these names are used simultaneously, right, by the Persians to describe the same region and actually ethnically as well. We have ethnic descriptors of a lot of the rebels. Uh, that Darius talks about in the Behistun inscription. So Aracha, the rebel king of Babylon, who calls himself Nebuchadnezzar IV, who is problematic for several reasons, uh, is called Armenian in the Persian and Urartian in the Semitic versions of the Behistun inscription. Now, uh, in uh, we have a similar situation here in Urartu and Armenia. So in both Urartian and in Armenian, we have evidence of mutual influence of the languages. So in Armenian, we have several words of Urartian origin. One example would be khinsuri in Urartian, which means apple, is khinsor in modern Armenian. It's the same word. It comes from Urartian. And if I'm not mistaken, the Armenian word for God, astvats, also comes from Urartian, a word, astiutsi if I'm not mistaken, which I believe meant God statue. And um, uh, same thing, in Urartian, we have evidence of Armenian influence as well. I believe the term Arziv, which is an eagle, uh, is found in Urartian as well, as well as other um, Indo-European terms that probably came from Armenian into Urartian. So we definitely, even though the royal family and the royal inscriptions of Urartu are in the Urartian language, which is in the Huro Urartian language family, which is comprised, as far as we know, of Hurrian and Urartian, though several linguists have tried to connect it to the modern Caucasian language group. Um, so Armenian is not linguistic re linguistically related to Urartian. Um, we, it's clear that there were Armenians and Urartians living side by side, and there were probably many Armenians already in the Armenian highland uh, in the period of the kingdom of Urartu, so from the 9th century to the 6th century BC. And, you know, we don't have any examples where the kings t tell us their personal names, unfortunately, so we don't know if there is a disparity. Right, because there are some theories that perhaps some of the later kings were in fact Armenian. Um, there's a later king called Erimena, 
there are some people who try to make a connection there. Um, yeah, there you have it. No, thank you for that. So when we're talking about Armenia, we're talking about a hybridization of all of these tribes and all these various elites. Regarding, however, the names of kings, I mean, it's something I've noticed, especially when you look at the recurring sort of, especially the recurring Persian names, such as Khosrow. Uh, I can't help but note that many of the royal dynasties within Armenia um, are foreign. Nevertheless, just to bring this back to the mm -hmm. conception of the, the revolt, which sort of brought Armenia into the fold, um, I believe Xenophon in the Chiropida, so this would have been written around the year 400, mentions a ruler called Tigranes. Of course, later we have Tigranes I and Tigranes II, but this is 300 years later, who had supposedly allied with Cyrus the Great. And this is characterized as some form of Armenian sort of state genesis in the sense that the Armenians are rebelling against what had been the imperial status quo in that region, which was the Median Empire. The Median Empire, which crossed over Media Atrapane and what is now northern Iran, large parts of eastern Anatolia, and the conquest of the Median dynasty by Cyrus facilitated the creation of the Archimedes Empire, which then expanded into Syria. And later, um, I forget, but I do apologize, the son of Cyrus goes in to conquer Can Egypt. Yes, Cambyses, thank you, uh, goes on. And Darius, of course, consolidates the empire and begins incursions into Thrace and, of course, Greece at the Battle of Marathon. So at the same time, we're talking about the creation of an Armenian state, the consolidation of an Armenian identity, which is beyond that of Uratu. So on the one hand, Uratu is post uh, pre-Armenian or proto-Armenian in the sense it occupies roughly the same territory as linking with the earlier map. However, its language is superseded as opposed to evolving into Armenia. We have some form of sort of origin story in this likely possibly apocryphal mention of Xenophon's mention of Tigranes and his alliance with Cyrus and the Chiropida. And then we have the formal subjugation of this new nation into the satrapy by Darius around the year 521. This is also around the same time, I think it's a hundred years later, that we have an attested dynasty assigned to that of the Armenians as well, because many of the positions of satrapies, some of them were appointed. Um, in many cases, they were hereditary. It helped bolster Archimedes' power that the hereditary satraps of these regions had some dynastic link or family link to the Archimedes court in Paris Garde and Persepolis. So it's possible that the Arontid dynasty, which is the first royal dynasty of Armenia, has some link with the Archimedes dynasty from a dynastic point of view. It's also important to understand that because of the creation of the satrapy and the subjugation of Armenia. We have the creation of an Armenian state coinciding with subjugation. So many of the elite within Armenia, many of the ancient families are polylingual. They speak Persian as well as speaking Old Armenian. They have their own gods, such as, um, I believe, uh, Aramazd and uh, Anahit. Uh, whilst at the same time, Armenia is coming under the influence of the religion coming out of the Archimedes Empire, which is Zoroastrianism which is going to exert a profound influence on Armenia um, for the next sort of thousand years. Do you think that's a fair assessment of the early Armenian state of affairs? That, you know, there, there are so many conflicting sources. Like you said, there's the mention in Herodotus with the Phrygian connection that a lot of people even today uh, take seriously. Uh, even though I think it's pretty clear that Herodotus's knowledge of Near Eastern history, especially the Mesopotamian tradition all the way up into Armenia, is quite corrupted by the time we get to him. Um, and then you have the um, texts of the Urartians themselves, which unfortunately, based on how laconic they are, are not super helpful in regards to local ethnography and ethnogenesis. And then you have the Achaemenid texts, 
right, from Darius and his successors. And we even actually, one of the only Achaemenid royal inscriptions from outside Iran proper is uh, the Xerxes Van inscription, which is at uh, Tushpa on the wall of the Urartian fortress. Uh, again, a full trilingual inscription, though again, quite laconic, due, and that's actually, funnily enough, due to Urartian influence on the Achaemenid uh, lit, um, written tradition, um, which is a subject for another discussion. Um, but And then that, of course, leads up to the Armenian sources, uh, later Armenian sources, where you get echoes of this history and this ethnogenesis and the struggles with the Medes, alliances with the Persians, which again connect to Xenophon, uh, the Cyropedia. So I think that's a fair assessment. It's a very murky period in history, but th there are so many angles at which to come at it from. I think what's interesting though about this beginning of Armenian statehood and subjugation into the form of a satrapy as illustrated in the Chiropoda is that this is an incredibly recurring theme throughout Armenian history. And it seems rather appropriate that Armenian history begins with this form of pseudo subjugation in which the Armenians are showing deference to a stronger outside power. And yet at the same time, they retain their own gods, their own autonomy, their own language, their own nobility, their own notables. And this persists and very much, this is very much sort of reinforced by later events. So this is where I sort of want Marcus's sort of um, input really, because the Archimedes overlordship over Armenia lasts 200 years until Alexander the Great begins his conquest of the Archimedes empire at the latter part of the fourth century BC. After which Armenia, having fought alongside Darius III at Guagamela, defects and becomes a satrapy of Macedon, of the Argea dynasty under Alexander. And after the wars of the Diadochi, the wars of the successors, the Seleucids establish themselves as the masters of the eastern half of Alexander's empire, Syria all the way over to Bactria and even India. And of course, Armenia therefore falls within the Seleucid remit. So almost again, just a, a matter of changing clothes, the Armenians have swapped one form of nominal client status um, to another dynasty, Achaemenid, Argeid, Seleucid. And this is also the same time where we begin to see the real sort of permutations as uh, a permeation of Greek culture into Armenia, albeit this has been a process ongoing since really at least the sort of fifth century. You mentioned Xenophon. Um, in particular, the Greek association with the Armenian gods and trying to twin them various Greek gods within their own pantheon. However, there is a fundamental moment in terms of the beginning of a more assertive Armenia, which is a battle we've mentioned several times, Marcus, which is the Battle of Magnesia, mm, in which the yes. Roman Republic defeats the forces of Antiochus III, Antiochus the would-be great, and not only is the Seleucid Empire unable to reassert its control over the remnants of Alexander's empire, it's forced across the Aegean and further and forms the new barrier. You can actually see on this map of the Empire of Tigranes at the Tarsus Mountains, creating the sort of Syrian state which is going to hold on weakly to the remnants of the Persian Empire, which will soon fall to the Parthians. So yeah, as the we're Lickling seeing... Mountains become that new frontier <coughs> established in that treaty uh, at the conclusion of the war, exactly right. But this is also a time that we begin to see an assertive Armenia, because really for the mm. first time in its history, if we are to date its history to the 6th century BC, there is no longer an obvious strong power with which Armenia can offer its services as a client to. The Seleucid Empire is in freefall collapse. The Parthians are beginning to encroach on this territory, but it will take them a hundred years to really establish themselves as in any way a successor to the Archimedes dynasty, which they're never able to achieve. And this is also important because towards the end, the Seleucids seem to be aware of this, of the growing power of Armenia. And this is one of the first times we also see another recurring theme in Armenian history, which is that of partition. Mm. 
western parts of Armenia in further western Anatolia, um, a, a region called Sofine is created as a separate satrapy. And again, this is the reason I selected this rather useful map, because you can see Sofine as distinct from the rest of Greater Armenia. And Greater Armenia has created its own satrapy. But after the Battle of Magnesia, the Oriented dynasty is overthrown, and a new dynasty is established under Artaxis, who creates the Artaxia dynasty of Armenia. Um, Marcus, is there anything really you want to say about the Artax Artaxia dynasty in the sense that they are the first sovereign dynasty of Armenia, leading us to the height of not only the height of the Artaxia dynasty, but the height of Armenian sort of imperial aspirations in the form of Tigranes II before the Roman subjugation in 67. I mean, you have canvassed it fairly well, and, and I would agree in so far that this is the uh, a trajectory where rather than Armenia just sort of being a, um, you know, a, a reference to a place and a people who uh, find themselves uh, in one way, in one way, stuck between these clashing cultures, which proves to be the Hellenic Greeks in the West and the Medes and Persians to their, their south, the east and southeast. Uh, and they do eventually end up asserting themselves. Uh, you, you mentioned like some of these battles that had occurred and these conflicts within this region. You know, uh, the Armenians, uh, for for much of their history, certainly from I would say almost uh, the Achaemenid dynasty of Persia up until the late medieval period, is that Armenians are always sought after, uh, or, or rather, Armenians make for much sought after troops and, and auxiliary forces. Um, you know, be it their, be it their, you know, their predisposition of making good cavalrymen or making hardy infantry that can fight in the Caucasus mountains or in, in Anatolia, they're very adaptable um, soldiers and that they, they prove it to be sought after. And whenever you look at these battles, be it Gorgamela or even, um, you know, Magnesia, I believe uh, Armenians even fought um, in the Mithridatic Wars a little bit later from this period, you know, you always see contingents of Armenian heavy cavalry, Armenian light cavalry, Armenian infantry. And they're from this point onwards, they become very sought after soldiers, but rather than just sort of being the a side story to the, the fate of say, you know, Darius, uh, Darius's Persia or to the Antigone or Seleucid dynasty, or rather a, a mere bolt on to the, to the Roman realm, which would expand um, eastwards towards it over these you know, a couple of centuries. In Armenia, you're right, does assert itself. It has its own identity. It has its own homeland, which is, uh, you know, within the regions we're talking about. And like you say, the sort of great Armenia forms uh, in this map forms the core for almost every um, manifestation, both in antiquity and sort of towards what I loathe to call the Dark Ages, but this sort of, what would you call it, a eight, six or 800 year time period where Armenia does actually assert itself and establishes not just um, independence of, of language and of culture and of identity, but actually a nation state in the, in, in, I dare say the, <laughs> the strict sense of the word. And, um, you know, we see it also with uh, a little bit later, for example, we, we, you mentioned there's like this, an old reference to a, a leader called Tigranes. And then we have actually these Kings of uh, Tigranes um, who, who follow uh, just before I think, um, the conquest of the East by uh, Pompey and then later by Caesar, and they actually establish a, a capital in a place called Tigranicurta. And so, uh, you know, a, 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 a people and a culture that aren't ascendant don't go doing that. But here we are, we sort of see this nascent culture rise up into statehood and actually assert itself in, in a relatively short space of time, actually. It's interesting because looking at Tigranes the second, I mean, Tigranes II is renowned as Tigranes, the King of Kings, and even here, this is a rather romantic portrayal of Tigranes, surrounded by his vassal kings, living up to the name of King of Kings. And as you can see on this map, not only is Tigranes massively expanding the empire, but he's enveloping all of these alternative laws. And I really just want to explain how this is possible, that Armenia can emerge into this position. So we talked about Parthian sort of incremental rise, Seleucid decline, and of course the, the arrival of the Romans. Well, during the final phase of the Seleucid dynasty, the Seleucids have ruled a re realm which is corresponding to 
Tarsus, the area around Adana in what is now Anatolia and Antikia, which is now Antioch, which is their capital, Damascus going down to Palestine, albeit with the um, revolt of the Maccabees, we now have a Jewish state as well. Because of this, because of this disintegration of the Seleucid dynasty, the loss of the East, and the constant infighting between the Seleucid claimers to the throne and the inability to proclaim one Seleucid sovereign, that and the fact that the Seleucids don't have vast available sources of manpower because they're reliant on a smaller section of Greek colonia who have established themselves since the era of Alexander the Great. Into this vacuum, Tigranes is really able to exert Armenian power um, in a way which hasn't really been projected before. Um, independence and sovereignty is one thing, but what we're seeing here is the brief creation of an Armenian empire, um, which you can say is the sort of hallmark which you know Armenian nationalists can look to feasibly. The uniting of Syria and Armenia, and again, just looking at this in terms of the broad sweep of history, this is going to be interesting in terms of the religious revolt, which happens um, around sort of 500 years afterwards. Nevertheless, it is interesting that albeit briefly, Tigranes is able to unite this region, which, as you can see on this map, through the network of vassals. Not only does it check Parthian interests by preventing the Parthians expanding beyond core Iran um, and Persis, beyond Mesopotamia, with their, what would later become the capital of Tessaphon, and move in to what is the old Assyrian region and into Anatolia. Um, they have a incredibly important strategic position in the sense that they control the region between the Caucasus, the Caspian, the Black Sea, and the Eastern Mediterranean as well. So in this sense, Tigranes represents before the Parthians, the sort of penultimate empire in the East, the Romans face. But why does this all come coming down? Well, even before Pompey the Great, I mean, Pompey the Great was doing nothing really than leading a mop-up of what his predecessors, Sulla and Lucullus, had already really achieved in the East. Sulla had been the great Roman general, later briefly dictator, who had defeated Mithridates the Great. Mithridates the Great was also, unfortunately for Tigranes, the ally of Armenia. So as an extension of the Mithridatic Wars, which at one point looked as if the Pontus, the state of Pontus could have actually removed all Roman influence from Anatolia. The Romans do not give up. They move into Armenia under the forces of Lucullus, again, a very unappreciated Roman general, and they decisively defeat the empire of Tigranes at the Battle of Tigranicurta in its capital. And a few years later, Tigranes formally submits himself as a client state to Rome. So you can say the Armenian sort of experimentation and empire is incredibly brief, albeit it does sort of indicate the sort of tenacity and the tactical brilliance of the Romans, despite the fact, as you mm. mentioned, Furious, the Armenians were renowned as cavalrymen to such an extent mm. that in Nic Nic uh, Niccolo Machiavelli's On War, he would actually admonish Tigranes for his over-reliance on cavalry against the main mm. Roman strength, which, which, which was indeed infantry. Indeed. Uh, just just two quick points, if I may, because uh, this is obviously, uh, like you say, we're trying to compress a lot of history into rel relatively short streams. So I won't get into the nitty gritty of battles per se, but I will say that you're quite right to say that Luc Lucullus is a, is a deeply unappreciated uh, Roman leader and a, a, a commander, most certainly. And his victory at Tigranicota is actually one of the great Roman uh, victories over its, uh, you know, over opposition. Um where they actually fight uh, outnumbered and on on foreign territory at an initial disadvantage and actually still win a, an incredible battle against you know armenians who themselves are capable fighters uh, like, as we've discussed they've they've um, uh, armenian troops have been sought after by the you know the the persians and the hellenistic states the Di diadochi etc and end up oftentimes fighting alongside the romans after this point um and so um, it, it's worth mentioning that if you have the time or the inclination, actually read up on the Battle of Tigranicota Tigran and also of Lucullus, because it's actually a really interesting campaign and deep, you know, often a man who's forgotten in the midst of, you know, Sulla, Gaius Marius, Caesar, etc. There's also something I want to mention. And, someone, um, sorry, good day. Um, just, just one point, and then by all means um, speak. Just, just one point, just on that notion of cavalry, Marcus. Why, in your view, do you think Lucullus was successful at Tigranicurta, but Crassus fate, um, was so ill-fated at Carhae against the Parthians only a few years later? 
Well, one thing that the colors demonstrated, or rather, um, probably the better way to answer it is at at Carey, the, there was the main point of insufficient cavalry forces against a because the Parthians had far more in the way of a, a mobile based army than what the um, Armenians were in terms of proportion of the forces. You know, the the, the Parthian army at uh, Carey is is almost almost exclusively um mounted you know archers uh, what you'd sort of describe as cataphractor you know like a, a heavily armed um cavalry arm uh, i believe even to some degree camels are used uh, both from a logistic standpoint and possibly a combat standpoint um and also uh, Cra uh crassus is himself not a gifted commander certainly not in the in 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 any standing uh, comparable to say Sulla, Lucullus, or Caesar, uh, not even Pom not even Pompey for that matter, and he 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 was too static in the battle. He basically conceded many advantages to the Parthians, and then especially after his son Publius is slain in battle, his spirit is broken and the army just is is leaderless. Whereas Lucullus was a was a, a, I hate to use the word, but Caesarian minded in how he went about his operations. Lucullus was a man who who took initiative, who, you know, went on the offensive, who you might say fights in the style of Caesar, or rather Caesar adopts the side, the fighting style of Lucullus and makes it more famous and becomes a greater exponent of it. But, um, you know, Lucullus doesn't allow essentially the, the Armenians to use their strength and, and rather than the Armenians thinking, well, the Romans are a smaller force, ergo they won't attack us. And the Romans actually sort of, almost hem the armenians in a in a in a hilly position where they can't use their forces properly and actually attacks from two separate directions or almost attacks them i believe in like an l shape of sorts and compresses the armenian army um in a disadvantageous position using topography against them and uh, as as we see battles such as um you know we see it at pidna we see it at um very famously uh, kind of kephale or sinocephale however you want to pronounce it the romans can actually fight um you know, on hilly ground and and be at the downhill sort of side of that equation and still prevail against forces that are, are well deployed and, and have strong cohesion. And Lucullus demonstrates that it's a granite curtain. Um, so I just want to jump in here with a completely different perspective. So the sort of picture you both have painted of both uh, not only the Artaxia dynasty, but also the Aranta dynasty, which I don't want to discount uh, because that's a quite a long history that they have there. Uh, that's very much the sort of standard Hellenistic view of the history of these Armenian dynasties as sort of being peripheral to the um, Greek world, the Hellenistic world, right? And um, very much... Uh, grounded in those narratives of the Greek and Roman historians. I wanted to kind of throw a curveball here. So one of the things, uh, so following the conquest of the Achaemenid Empire by Alexander, um, he doesn't conquer the entire Achaemenid Empire. There are a few territories that remain with their own um, lords who are sort of essentially independent states. Um, or at least uh, nominally dependent. So those are, uh, I believe in modern scholarship, they call them the Perso-Macedonian dynasties. So you have the Areorathids in Cappadocia. You have the Mithridatids of Pontus, the Orontids in Armenia, and then the Atropatenians in Media Atropatene. And the influence of the Orontids on Armenian history and on uh, the later what we call Artaxiad, of course, they don't call themselves that. Um, Artaxiad history is quite profound because like uh, you mentioned earlier, there is that connection to the Achaemenid dynasty, which is extremely important for, um, for Tigran and then even later kings as well. Uh, I believe actually we have an Orontid family tree and an inscription from the kingdom of Comagene, I want to say from King Antiochus of um, Comagene, where he sort of uh, traces the Orontid family back to the Achaemenids and that Achaemenid connection. 
And uh, they're sort of still in that cultural milieu, even much later following the collapse of the Achaemenids. The Arontid dynasty is essentially, I, I want to call it a regional kingdom because they don't really have that imperialist view of Tigran, uh, though they do end up conquering a few territories. Now, we don't exactly have a narrative history from them because we have very few inscriptions, very few written evidence from the Arontid period. There are a few texts I will talk about in just a moment. But we know just from the names of cities. For example, you have uh, Sopene there in the center, which uh, eventually we get the city Arsamosata founded there, uh, named after Arsamis, one of the Arontid kings of Armenia in the mid-third century. And then you also have Samosata, uh, named after uh, the Armenian king Samos, or Shamush, actually that comes from Akkadian Babylonian, but that's that's a mysterious connection there. Uh, named after, again, a king in the third century, a Arontid king. Uh, and these were probably uh, either areas assigned to them, perhaps, or areas that were conquered. Again, uh, Cappadocia, the Ar Ariarathids are sort of... Um, viewed as a dynasty that didn't really do anything in terms of territorial expansion, though they do end up uh, conquering Tiana and Cataonia, right? So there are a lot of conquests going on and border shifting of these Perso-Macedonian dynasties that are not covered by the Greek historians. I think that's important to note. Um, they actually are kind of a little more aggressive than we think they are, uh, at least in standard in the standard interpretation of history of this period. Uh, uh, I think, yes, please. Yes. I, I think what I was trying to emphasize really um, was this, you know, nominal client right. status. I mean, th this is again, something I really want to emphasize is that I don't, I really don't want to give the impression that I do just regard Armenia as peripheral. If I did, then I wouldn't oh, be no, doing no. A, um, <laughs> an Armenian focused stream. But, but in the same sense that we look at, I say, for example, look at the Holy Roman Empire and you look at a state like, I, I wouldn't say Prussia because Armenia doesn't have the same sort of militaristic vein, except in the case of Tigran. But say, for example, other states within the Holy Roman Empire, which would gain, gain uh, territories through marriage or conquest, such as, say, for example, take the Prussian conquest of Silesia or even the Austrian conquest of Austria itself, the Habsburg conquest, conquest of Austria after the Battle of uh, Marchfeld. All these little things are indicating that within a imperial superstructure, we have these local regional lords who are expanding their own domains. And in this sense, Armenia is absolutely no different. You have all of these powerful satraps who are wanting to expand their own dynastic possessions, whether it be under the nominal overlordship of the King of Kings, whether it be the Archimanid King of Kings, or whether it be the Lord of Asia in the form of Alexander. T Tigran is interesting, though, because the ambition is just so much greater. And this is something I also wanted to just bring up to you, Gadea, which is the title of King of Kings. Yes. On the one hand, superficially, you can say that the title of Shah and Shah is a superficial imitation of the Archaemenids. And also, you can say the Megas Basilius, which was the title of the Seleucid ruler. On the other hand, though, there have been sort of imitations of that or sort of allusions to that with the Kingdom of Aratu. And there have also been allusions to that later in Armenian history with the uh, Bagratid dynasty. So I wonder, is it possible in a sense to actually think of the title of Shah and Shah or King of Kings as being distinctly Armenian and not just a Persian import, especially if we also look at the Medians who also had imperial aspirations and predated the Achaemenids and of course have a storied history with the sort of transition between Aratu and Armenia. Right. Uh, excellent, excellent point there. Um, before we go to that, I wanted to mention one thing. The Artaxiads called themselves Arontid, actually. Artaxias I, we have inscriptions from him uh, in Aramaic, which, of course, uh, still the sort of lingua franca of the region left over from the Achaemenid period. He calls himself 
Rwanda Gun, which is perhaps Yervanda Gun or Arantid. So Tigran is actually still sort of in that Perso-Macedonian uh, sort of tradition. Uh, so it's not surprising that later on he does adopt that title, Basileos Basileon, King of Kings, Khshayathia, uh, Khshayathianam in the original Old Persian of Darius and his successors. Um, one thing I want to emphasize about that, you mentioned not just a Persian import, right? And the concept, as a Mesopotamianist, I uh, hate to always bring up Mesopotamia, but it's actually a, not an Achaemenid concept at all. It's a Mesopotamian concept of uh, kingship, so that which dates back long before uh, the Persians had arrived in the Near East. Uh, Naram Sin, the grandson of Sargon of Akkad, in the twenty-third century BC, uh, names his son Shar Kalishari, King of Kings, and of course he sort of creates this idea of uh, universal kingship in his ideal of imperialism. And really, it comes from the Mesopotamian influence on Cyrus and his successors that um, we get that title, Khshayathia, uh, Khshayathianam, for the uh, Achaemenids. And uh, as a Perso-Macedonian dynasty, a sort of successor state of the Achaemenid Empire, um, Armenia being that, uh, it's, it's really not that surprising with those deep connections, which they felt. And as we see in the, that genealogy we get from the texts in the epigraphic texts in Comagene, that the Arantids and Tigranes himself as a sort of successor of the Arantids still saw themselves as connected to the Achaemenid royal dynasty, uh, which is a very strong connection that, as you said, echoes into the medieval period. I mean, Zakarian that you talked about, the, not, um, the lords of Armenia within the Georgian empire. Uh, in Georgian, they are called Mahagrzeli um, uh, or Yergaina Pazug in Armenian, the long armed, again, a reference to Artaxerxes III again, stretching that back to the Achaemenid period. And I don't, um, even though we don't want to sort of limit that to just being a Persian import, because there are also the local, um, like you said, there, there's some evidence of that from the Urartian inscriptions themselves, that concept of king of kings. Um, I, I would say that being a successor, the Achaemenid Empire, a successor state, being a successor to that Urartian tradition, to that Mesopotamian tradition, uh, all had an impact on why Tigran chose that title when he had his imperialist ambitions in the mid uh, first century BC. Thank you for that, Gadea. Sorry, Marcus is having connection issues. Hopefully he can rejoin us at some point. Now onto the next stage of the story, which actually segues quite nicely if we're talking about Tigranes and the Orontid connection with the original Archaemenids and how the so-called Artaxia dynasty wished to retain that imperial distinction through dynasty, which linked back to the Archaemenids through Darius. Now this comes and becomes interesting in the sense that we're transitioning not just to a new dynasty, but into a new state of client relations for Armenia. If, if you remember old films like um, Marcus, do you remember the original decline and fall of the Roman Empire? Oh yes, the '64 version with uh, like James Mason and, and Alec, Christopher yeah, Plummer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if you recall, they mention essentially the, the two nations which are not of Rome, which is of course Germania and Persia. Mm -hmm. But at the sort of the sort of you can say the uh, the great sort of succession summit at Vindabonum, um, where Marcus Aurelius will be murdered. Um, the Armenian king arrives. In fact, the Armenian king plays a very prominent role in the story. In fact, he becomes a, becomes a major um, antagonist towards the end. Armenia, in the sense, is the sort of fourth kingdom in the sort of what remains of the East. 
you have you know minor principalities minor vassal states such as colchis and pantacapium albeit they'll eventually sort of disintegrate but armenia survives as a empowered client state and its importance is because of this geography between the two great warring empires. I'll just bring up this map, even though it's slightly beyond our time frame. And this is the Sasanian Empire rather than the Parthian Empire, but the geography is similar. This map really should indicate how Armenia, being on the crossroads between these two great empires, the Parthian, later Sasanian dynasty, and the Roman, later Byzantine empires, Eastern Roman Empire rather, um, why our control of Armenia was such a contentious issue over centuries and centuries. And it's from the reign of Tigranes II that the Romans begin to establish a client-state relationship. At the same time, the Parthians are getting involved in various succession disputes. And this is where we have a transition from a Achaemenid connection with the dynasty in Armenia to a Parthian connection. I, I believe the first Parthian ruler to rule over Armenian in his own right is uh, uh, Volanes I. And later on, this is again part of a long sort of trajectory of Roman client state relations. You know, under the time of Mark Antony, Armenia is considered not only part of the Roman Empire, but even Mark Antony's own sphere of influence. By the beginning of the first century AD, this is becoming contentious with Parthia expanding into Armenia at the same time. And it comes to the point where Nero actually proclaims a member of the Parthian dynasty, Tiridates I, who had actually originally been a client state of the Parthian Empire, as a Roman client by crowning himself, Nero crowning Tiridates, the king of Armenia, thus establishing a somewhat stable, <laughs> stable as you can sort of say, say it can, could be, uh, Arsacid dynasty from Arsaces, the founder of the Parthian Empire up until 428, where the Arsacid dynasty is displaced. Now, this is interesting because some chroniclers have said Nero was, effectively this contributed to Nero's ultimate deposition seven years later, because Nero was ceding Armenia back to the Parthians. Yet at the same time, I actually think this is rather clever because this, I believe, plays a role later on when we talk about the Christianization of the Armenian state which is the fact that you have a cadet branch of the Arsacid dynasty, which is now ruling in Armenia. In fact, Tiridates himself, his father had been briefly a Parthian king. I believe this is actually a potential source of sort of systemic antagonism, which has been instigated by Rome to ensure that there'll be a constant succession dispute <laughs> between the Parthian empires and the Armenian kingdom so in many ways to actually keep them hostile as opposed to bring them together, <laughs> given the fractious nature of um, uh, Parthian dynastic politics. Uh, do either of you have anything to comment on my uh, my theory there, trying to give Nero some slack? Uh, good, good deal. Uh, sure. Uh, I think that's a very interesting idea. Uh, I actually had not heard that before. You know, this this period of the early uh, Arsakid or Arshaguni uh, dynasty, especially the first and second centuries, the era when the pre-Sasanian era is a pretty murky period in Armenian historiography. There aren't a lot of texts that cover this period because, again, this is sort of a few centuries prior to the introduction of the Armenian alphabet and the foundation of Armenian literature and historical tradition. And it's sort of post, uh, post Tigran II, post Artaxia dynasty. Um, but I think that's a very interesting idea. And it's interesting because, you know, Armenia was actually pretty fair, as stable as you could uh, say it could be <laughs> in those centuries with uh, sort of coexisting with the Parthian Empire and uh, the Roman Empire as, as sort of a buffer state between them. And it, it's it's actually quite remarkable how astute, especially those early 
Arsakid uh, Armenian kings were at sort of navigating the political landscape when, uh, of course, a lot of those other sort of vassal kingdoms like Osroene, Komagene, they sort of end up disappearing from the historical scene. Uh, the kingdom of Armenia remains its own power throughout the period. And of course, once we get into the Sasanian period, we truly have that secession dispute you're talking about where the the Sassanids have usurped the rightful Iranian throne in Iran and who's next in line but the Arsakid in Armenia who's related to the Parthian royal family. And that, of course, leads to several wars between Armenia and the Persian Empire. So I think that's quite a good observation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. <laughs> um, but yes, indeed, I was trying to link this especially to... Um... Tiridates the third and uh, the lead up to Christianity and this idea of, I mean, to compensate, the Sasanians had to claim a dynastic origin, which actually preceded that of the Achaemenids to compensate for their having usurped the throne from the Parthians in the middle of the third century AD. But just before we get to that point, I think it's important to note that within this long history of Roman Parthian conflict, which isn't resolved, rather the Parthian Empire disintegrates and, as has been mentioned, is replaced by the Sasanian dynasty. There is a brief moment in time, uh, kind of like the Roman provinces of Mesopotamia, where Trajan conquers Armenia, I believe in the year 114, and upon Trajan's death in 117, Hadrian performing a role which he does routinely throughout the empire of consolidation and building fortifications from, of course, Hadrian's Wall, etc., but throughout the entirety of the empire, including Castello Sant'Angelo, we see a we see a retrenchment of the Roman Empire, we see a withdrawal, and Armenia is abandoned in that process, and its brief sort of Roman rule collapses very quickly, and it returns to being an independent semi-satrap between these two states at the same time. I also want, because I've I've set up this idea of there being a, of Nero, you know, giving Nero some credit in the sense that Nero was actually establishing a systemic flaw in the relations between the Persian Empire and Armenia through the dynastic claimant, and of course this comes to a fall with uh, Tiridates III. But there are several phases with the Roman Persian conflict, and they'll be renewed just before the final dissolution of the Sassanian Empire in the seventh century, and its eventual conquest by the Rashidun and later Umayyad dynasties. But during the third century, I believe there is a series of disasters in the early third century. Um, which Roman emperor was it, Marcus, who was captured by the Sasanians? I forget. Was it Valerian? Uh, sorry, yes. Yes, it was Valerian. Valerian, the Battle of Edessa. So that represents a low point in this general struggle between the Persians and the Romans. Yet, when we get to Diocletian's reign, post Aurelian's uh, Renovatio Imperii, the re reconsolidation and restoration of the empire, giving the title of really and literally the restorer of the world, Diocletian is able to win a battle at uh, Satala within Armenia itself and is able to detach, not only detach um, the Sasanian Empire from Armenia, but is able to establish Roman control east of the river Euphrates in Osrohene and Sofen. And it's at this point, really, where I believe there are the conditions really facilitating the Christianization of the Roman Empire, because correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Gudea, but the traditional story is, I believe, Tiridates, the then king of Armenia, the Arsacid king of Armenia, uh, was suffering from a bout of madness. And Gregory the Illuminator, the sort of patriarch of all the Armenians who would later become and the converter of the Armenian nation uh, was imprisoned due to his potential role, I believe, in a conspiracy against Tiridates' father. He was released and he was able to temporarily sort of cure 
the king of his madness. Thereafter, the king converted to Christianity and proclaimed Armenia to be the first sort of Christian state. However, sort of my belief, as with all of these things, is more skeptical. You mentioned the fact that the Sasanians had usurped the Arsacid dynasty in Persia. In fact, during the first 50 years of that, the Armenian kings had ambitions on the restoration of control in that region, using Armenia as basically a springboard, possibly with Roman support, for an invasion. However, it is very obvious that by 299, whilst Armenia is free from Persian influence and under Roman influence, Diocletian has no interest in going further and conquering the Persian Empire as his latest successor, Julian, would. So, rather than, again, trying to um, remain culturally part of Iran, you are now in a situation where you can definitively break from that Persian influence, from that Persian control and establish an Armenian nationality, ironically under a Parthian king. And Christianity, therefore, to my mind, is that perfect surrogate in the sense that this is even during the Diocletianic persecutions within the Roman Empire. So this isn't just asserting Armenian independence against the Sasanian Empire and their Zoroastrian religion but it's also asserting independence from the resurgent paganism of the Roman Empire as well. And I believe, given the political situation at that time, given the succession crisis, given the recent Roman victories against the Sasanian Empire, I can't help but feel that these contributed to the decision to convert Armenia to Christianity. Well, um, you know, like you said, you uh, a lot of the time, especially with a lot of these uh, historical sources of late antiquity, you have to take a more skeptical approach. Um, like you said, the traditional story is that, well, there, there was the king uh, Khosrov II, uh, the short, who reigned from about 252 to 258. And he was involved in this struggle with the Sasanians. Again, probably... Uh, Armenian attempts to restore the Arsakid Empire from Armenia. Again, the, this is sort of a recurring theme. We have Tigran II taking that Achaemenid title, King of Kings, acting as sort of restoration of that tradition. So we have this repeat again in the mid-3rd century AD. And the story goes that St. Gregory's father, Anak, a, another Parthian was used as an agent by the Sassanids to assassinate uh, Tiridates III's father, who was king of Armenia, Khosrov II. So, again, a very convoluted story there. But, uh, of course, Tiridates later is taken to Rome. He has a Roman education. Right, he's brought up there while Armenia for several decades is actually un under direct Sassanid control. Um, the Sassanid king of kings, Narse, was actually king of Armenia prior to, uh, he was put on the throne of Armenia prior to uh, acceding to the Sassanid throne, becoming Sassanid king of kings. He's the same king who lost to Diocletian at that battle of Satala in 298. Again, Another echo from history, Darius III being the satrap of Armenia prior to becoming a Achaemenid king of kings. So uh, Tiridates III, when he returns, uh, the story goes that there are a group of virgins, of virgin nuns, who are Christian, who escape from Diocletian's persecutions to Armenia, and Tiridates III wants to marry the most beautiful of them, uh, Haripsime as kings are wont to do. And uh, they are led by a woman named Gayane. She's the leader of these uh, nuns, virgin nuns. And when she refuses to marry him, uh, he has them killed, which causes his madness. He thinks he's a pig. Again, there are biblical echoes here with Nebuchadnezzar going mad at the end of his reign. And... Uh, uh, Tiridates actually 
had found that uh, St. Gregory was actually among amongst his royal retinue. And when he found out that Gregory was the son of Anak, who had assassinated his father, he had him thrown in a pit. Um, also, well, because he was a Christian and there were the Diocletian persecutions. And eventually one of the family members of Tiridates, who was secretly a Christian, uh, has them bring St. Gregory out of the pit and he's able to cure the king of his madness. And in return, he sort of converts to Christianity. Now, of course, um, there are other views of what happened there. Uh, that's the view of the Armenian historians, so from late antiquity, who of course had their own agenda and were usually churchmen sponsored by different uh, noble families within Armenia in the late kingdom period and post kingdom. So I think your analysis that there is some sort of Roman influence going on here to try and uh, break Armenia from that Iranian sphere of influence is an interesting uh, hypothesis. The unfortunate thing is that the texts themselves don't reflect that. So it's very difficult to come to very definitive conclusions regarding why Armenia converted at this time and why Armenia converted at all, right? So I think, I think your analysis is a pretty interesting perspective that should be uh, taken seriously. Just, just to emphasize that, um, St. Gregory the Illuminator, of course, wasn't the first to introduce Armenia to Christianity. The Armenian Apostolic Church is apostolic in the sense that the Armenians were proselytized to by St. Thaddeus and St. Bartholomew. And due to that early proselytization from the first century up until the fourth century, the Christian church within Armenia was quite well established, albeit there were, you know, very large sections of Christianity operating from Syria. So that connection from places such as Antioch to, um, am I correct in saying what would have been at this time the cultural capital of Armenia? Because of course, Tigrana Kurta is now sort of being replaced by Amida, which is no longer part of the Armenian uh, realm and the city of Devin uh, later becomes a very important site of the Armenian sort of state um, later on this period. Um, what would you say was the central city of Armenia around this late period of the Arsacid dynasty? So in the, in the really late period, you have Devin becoming the capital of Armenia. But in this period, when you have uh, the struggle with the Persians, uh, the the capital is Vagarshapat, which was founded by the Arsakid king uh, Vagarsh uh, Balarj in Persian uh, in the early second century. So that had become the capital. Of course, um, Tigrano Kerta had actually remained a capital for a while. Actually, uh, the view of a lot of uh, historians nowadays is that the the engagement at Tigrano Kerta was not as destructive or decisive as um, Hellenistic uh, Roman historians uh, make it out to be, because it did remain an important uh, city even after that. Um, but yeah, the cultural capital was Vagar Shabbat, and actually that's where modern Echmiadzin is, Echmiadzin being the oldest sort of state cathedral in the world. Uh, Echmiadzin cathedral, the complex, is actually in Vagar Shabbat. I believe the city was officially renamed back to Vagar Shabbat from Echmiadzin. Echmiadzin was always the sort of uh, uh, Catholicosate complex rather than the name of the city. The city was always uh, Vagar Shabbat. And uh, that, that was from the second century, yeah. And uh, just for my own sort of um, appraisement of... Uh... Armenian job, uh, geography. Um, the Hashapat is in the east of the country, closer to Erevan than it is to Tigranagurta, which is now Diakaba in Anatolian Kurdistan. Yes. 
Yes, so um, Vagar Shabbat would actually be closer to Artaxata, which was the capital that the had Artaxia, been founded yeah. by, by Artaxias, uh, Artaxias yeah. the first in the mid-2nd uh, century, which some historians say is um, Hannibal. Some historians say Hannibal actually helped him with the design of the city, the placement of the city, though, of course, there is no other evidence to support that. But just an interesting side note. But yes, Vagar Shabbat is closer to Artaxata, which was the capital of Armenia proper, Greater Armenia, I should say, Greater Armenia proper. And then, of course, eventually Devin is also nearby, near Artaxata. And Artaxata, of course, was near the older capital, uh, Yer Yervantashat or Orontosata in Greek, which was the capital that had been founded by Yervant or Orontes IV, last king of the proper Orontid dynasty uh, at the turn of the third and second centuries BC. And of course, the capital before that, Armavir, is also rather close to Vagar Shabbat. So all of these uh, capitals of Armenia proper are fairly close to each other, Armavir. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, Vagar Shabbat, Devin, Artaxata. They're all fairly close to each other geographically, and they are actually all within uh, the modern-day Republic of Armenia. So they've all been properly excavated, except for the residential section of Yervandashat, which is located in Turkey, meaning it has not been properly excavated. It's interesting because I, I also want to get your appraisal. My general point was going to be going back to the original point, which was why I believe Christianity was, there was a politic reason for the conversion to Christianity because Armenian Christ Christianity had already taken a significant hold. Zoroastrianism was still incredibly prevalent, linking back to the Sasanian dynasty, but Christianity, I believe, was the only alternative to Zoroastrianism that had a chance of being able to foster the sense of Armenia independence vis-a-vis -vis the Sasanians, which is why I go back to this point, in a similar way as to um, the political reasons as to why Constantine decided to begin the process of conversion or the conversion of the Roman Empire, albeit it should be noted that he didn't do so definitively. It was um, Theodosius the Great who did so definitively. But anyway, going back to Armenia, uh, just a couple of points. One is it's interesting how you have all of these capitals located in the same region. Why is it that Armenia never was able to establish its successive capital? Because we're talking about the very early, late antiquity, early medieval period. And later, the capital was moved towards Kars, I believe in the city of Ani, which would be a major medieval center for the Armenian state. So why do you believe really up until the solidification of, sort of control around Erevan, which was never really the center of a great Armenian empire, why do you believe the Armenians were unable to establish a large permanent capital unlike, say, for example, the Eastern Romans in Constantinople, or even the Parthian Sasanians in Tessaphon? Uh, well, there, it depends on the capital you're talking about. So in the case of Armavit, which was the capital of the Arantid dynasty, um, the problem was the, the Ahurian River shifted course. And so Armavir became a little bit too far from the river. So the capital, a new capital was made at Yervandashat, uh, which was a little bit closer to the river and with new uh, palatial complexes, residential areas um, as well. And then eventually you have Artaxata, which I think was founded as a sort of a break between the Arantid and Artaxia dynasties. Um, and Yervandashat had never really been established as a sort of real metropolitan capital the way we think about it. Uh, they didn't, again, it was founded by the last king of the Aranta dynasty. So his ambitions were never realized with that city fully. And then Artaxata was, of course, um, it, it never lost his capital status of Armenia when Tigrana. Tigranokerta was founded by Tigran II. I think Tigranokerta was 
supposed to be a more imperial capital, more near the center of the empire between sort of Syria and Armenia. Absolutely. If, I mean, yeah. just look just look at this map, say, for example. Tigranokerta yeah. is an imperial capital in the sense that it probably represents the summit of Tigran's ambition in trying to unite Syria with Armenia through the creation of consolidated central capital, which would allow for the establishment of an empire. But yes, absolutely. Exactly. So Ar Artaxata remained the capital of Arme greater Armenia proper during that time, like it shows in the map. And then uh, actually Vagarshapat was founded in the second century. And I believe around that time when these, around the time these Sasanians were rising and there were several wars between the kingdom of Armenia and the Sasanian empire, the Sassanids went in and destroyed Artaxata after a siege. So Artaxata was militarily wiped out and destroyed. Um, and then I believe, uh, I'm not entirely sure why Devin replaced Vararshapat as the sort of political center. That one is a good question. But as you can see, there are different reasons why capitals shifted. So either um, geographic reasons, like with Armavir, or uh, political reasons, like with Tigran the second or for uh, military reasons, military destruction, like with the case of Artaxata being destroyed. So it definitely depends on the time period. Uh, your time. Armenian history is so long that you have time for all of these developments to be so diverse, like with capital changes. I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. And this is moving on to, um, just before we get on to the creation of the Armenian alphabet, I just want to look into the idea of partition and schism. Because as we know today, Eastern Anatolia was home to a large Armenian population. And indeed, if we even look at Tigranokerta, a former imperial capital of an Armenian dynasty. And yet, the entire region that we know was the tiny sort of truncated part which existed within the Russian and later Soviet section of Armenia. So partition is a recurring theme in Armenian history also between two great empires which dominated the Caucasus. And this is the period of the first sort of great partition rather than just the continuation of the client state for Armenia, and you can say the reduction of Armenian nationality for the first time, um, Armenian statehood. And you can say, at the one hand, I mentioned Theodosius the Great as the emperor who formally consolidated the Roman Empire as a Christian state with the Council of Constantinople. And yet he was also the last Roman emperor to rule over the United Empire for definitively splitting it into East and West with his sons Honorius and uh, um, I forget now, Arcadius. When you look to the situation in the East, Theodosius the Great is trying to establish his authority against latest usurpers such as Eugenius, and the Roman Empire is in a very precarious position after the Battle of Adrianople. So you can say that despite the fact that the Armenians have, on their own volition, decided to convert Christianity, and now the Romans are finally following suit, and they are now officially adopting Christianity as the state religion within the Roman Empire. Um, Marcus, maybe back and get your sort of a, uh, point here, is that this coincides with what you can possibly argue is a betrayal, but I would argue is the consequence of the peripheral sort of importance of Armenia as a strategic consideration in the endless wars between Persia and Rome. And as such, Armenian nationality was actually sacrificed through a series of partitions. And this is the partition map here. It's not quite as severe as the partition that exists later with the uh, piece of um, Amesia between Suleiman the Magnificent and the Safavid dynasty in the 16th century. Nevertheless, it, as you can see with the Armenian provinces within the Roman Empire, it detaches quite a significant number of Armenians from the original Armenian state from around 383 to 384 um, in what was arguably one of the most successful um, peace treaties 
between the Armenians, sorry, between the Romans and between the Persians. Um, and the reason the Romans were on the back foot was because of the disaster of Julian the Apostate's campaign to Ctesiphon um, and his death at the Battle of Samara. Thereafter, the Romans were on the back foot. And this was, if anything, an acknowledgement that the Romans needed to focus on other campaigns as the Western Empire was beginning to disintegrate. Um, the rest of Armenia is nominally independent and will remain independent until 428, until the Sasanians definitively conquer the territory. Um, I believe it was under Baram V. Um, and thereafter, from 428, the region will be known as Sasanian Armenia or even just Persa Armenia, representing the fact that it has diminished in status away from a semi-independent client kingdom to, again, a reconsolidation under the Persians. And the Persians also renewed during this time a persecution of the Christians in favor of Zoroastrian at the same time. Um, so Marcus, why do you think the Romans decided, arguably, to betray their Christian brethren and secede most or acknowledge the loss of so much territory, Christian territory, to the Sasanian Empire. I think we've lost Marcus. Um, so I might as well ask you, um, you Gadea, the same question. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think perhaps the issue there might be. Mm -hmm. That's a very big, big question. Uh, why would they? I think most of it was just not being physically possible to um, keep control of Armenia. What, we have to remember there's another fact factor here at play. In the late uh, Arsacid dynasty of Armenia, in Armenia, you could say there are four factions at play, four power players. You have the the king himself, the Arsakid king. So their royal interests, the Armenian royal interests, and then you have the interests of the nobility that favor the Romans. So you have the the interests of the nobility on the side of the Romans, and you also have the interests of the nobility on the side of the Persians, right? You have a big split in the Armenian noble houses, which are extremely powerful. They're so powerful that they remain extremely relevant until essentially the period of the the Seljuk invasions and the Ilkhanate. And then you have church interests. So the interests of the Armenian church uh, versus royal interest versus interests of the nobility. And then you have the foreign interests. So the interests of the Romans and the interests of the Persians themselves. Right, so you have all of these forces that are essentially tearing the country apart. Right, we have to remember in the fourth century the conflict between the king and between the church was massive. We have King Pap, a famous Roman ally, at first, uh, who reigned in the early three seventies, who initially fought heavy battles with the Persians to sort of kick them out of um, the sort of central region of the kingdom of Armenia. And then he ends up embroiled in a church conflict where he ends up uh, trying to tax the church. And, and then you have the patriarch, the Catholicos of the time, Nerses the Great, going against the king. And then the king ends up killing him and this, of course, turns the nobility against uh, the, uh, the king. And, of course, this spirals out of control until 428, when you have uh, Artaxias IV, king of uh, the Sassanid section of Armenia. As you can see, still a significant part of, I, I would say, the, the large part of Armenia was still under the control of the, uh, the Arsacid kings under Sassanid suzerainty. And Ardashes IV has a conflict with the nobility until the nobles essentially, and the church as well, they deliver him to the Sassanid king and say, we don't want any king anymore. We'd rather just have uh, a Marsban, right? Essentially a satrap control Armenia rather than having to deal with the interests of the Arsacid dynasty 
right? So it's a very complex political situation, both internally in the Arsakid kingdom of Armenia, as well as externally with the foreign influence. So I hope uh, that answers your question. Well, this is significant. And the reason I, I bring this up is because, again, I'm looking for reasons as to why the Armenians would become further distance from Hellenic civilization in the form of Eastern Rome. One of the most significant developments during this time is the creation of the Armenian alphabet uh, by Mashthot um, in 405. Um, I just included a little image of the Armenian alphabet on the bottom right hand side and indeed the imperial capital at, or the royal capital at Devin, which it should be noted still at this time is very similar to Byzantine architecture or late Roman imperial architecture that you see elsewhere in the empire. So there's still quite a significant religious interest. But the reason I, I mention this is because, of course, viewers on this channel will remember sort of uh, Cyril and Methodius, the saints who introduced the Glagolithic alphabet, and then the Bulgarian scholars at Plevni who refined it into the Cyrillic alphabet and how important the Cyrillic alphabet wasn't just to the proselytization of Orthodox Christianity throughout all of the Slavic nations, but indeed in creation, creating a Slavic identity and indeed in helping preserving that incredible linguistic unity between the Slavic nations, whether you be in Slovenia or whether you be in Russia. So how significant was the creation of the Armenian alphabet in the fifth century, rather than just say, for example, importing the Latin script or the Greek script in terms of enabling a enduring state of Armenian nationhood at a time where Armenian sovereignty was disintegrating? Right. So there are a lot of elements at play here. So like I said, there were so many forces both within and uh, external forces as well that were acting to tear the country apart that, you know, one of the kings, Vram Shabu, uh, who was the king of the Sassanid portion of Armenia after the partition, at the, he was king at the turn of the 4th and 5th centuries, a uh, king for a significant amount of time of the Arsakid dynasty. Uh, his predecessors had sort of chosen hard power, uh, to use sort of political terminology. They had tried to uh, go after their interest with hard power. So kings like Arshak II in the 360s, 370s, tried with through military means to neutralize the Sassanid threat. And of course, that ended with his assassination. Uh, and of course, his successor, Pap, again, tried with hard power to consolidate the country, tax the church, get more revenue to fund more conflict. That failed as well. Vram Shapu in uh, 405, he decided to go with soft power to sort of establish uh, his own authority within Armenia. And that was through his sponsorship of the creation of the Armenian alphabet. Now, the Armenian church, of course, at the time uh, prior to the creation of the Armenian alphabet, um, did services and things in uh, Syriac, right? And that was not, of course, not the language of the common people. The common people could not connect with that. And of course, that's around the time when King Vram Shabu and the leader of the church, Sahak Bartev, Sahak the Parthian, uh, his uh, sort of um, nickname, Bartev, means Parthian in Armenian, uh, decided to create the Armenian alphabet so that the Bible and all of the liturgies, services, could, could be translated into Armenian. And, uh, of course, Mashtots, who was a monk of the Armenian church, traveled around the Near East, made a lot of comparisons, made a lot of connections, and eventually he came up with this alphabet uh, for Armenian. And it's a very, very good alphabet for Armenian. I mean, uh, 
if you compare, it's such a good alphabet that even modern Armenian, which has some changed pronunciations, um, uh, it's still very easy to spell words utilizing this alphabet of mashtot. It's so accurate and so well made, particularly for the Armenian language, right? Uh, like if you try to read Armenian written with Latin characters, or there are some people who try to write it with Cyrillic, it's almost unreadable. <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, but this project was very much an exercise in soft power of the royal dynasty, the Arsakid dynasty of Varam Shabu. And he was e exceptionally successful in this. Unfortunately, we don't know that much else about this king because he was more involved in cultural aspects rather than military. He chose not to be involved in sort of, um, I guess that speaks a lot about him that the texts don't say. But uh, yeah, I would say the creation of the alphabet was an incredible exercise in, so in the soft power of the Armenian leadership at the time. It's interesting that you also bring up the fact that the Syriac alphabet was used at the same time. Of course, the Syriac alphabet is slightly more modern compared to the Latin and Greek equivalents. It was around about the inception of Christianity that the Syriac script is beginning to be used and we see the development of, you can say, the classical Syriac language from Aramaic, which of course was the lingua franca for the entire sort of Mesopotamia, Syria region. And the reason I mention this is that, of course, you can still hear mass using the old Syriac rite as part of the Syriac Orthodox Church, which of course begins to divert away from the church in Constantinople, the official state Roman church, because it's only 46 years after the creation of the Armenian alphabet that we have the Council of Chalcedon in 451. It's not so much from my understanding that the Armenians actually begin to formally declare a schism in the church away from the imperial church in Constantinople. But they do, along with many, I believe, monophysites, those who believe um, that Christ have one nature, which is divine nature, and myophysites, those who believe that Christ has a conjoined nature between human and divine, as opposed to the Catholic conception where Christ is fully human and fully divine. And it's only in the Second Council of Divin, again, the new rural capital, that we see the schism of the Armenian church to become the Armenian Apostolic Church. And the reason this is significant is, from my understanding, in terms of bringing up this idea that the Romans had aided in the partition and the surrendering of Armenia to the Zoroastrian, Sasanian Empire. At the same time, you're having the Monophysite controversy, which facilitates, say, for example, in the red and blue conflict in the revolt in the early reign of Justinian I, which nearly leads to civil war in the empire. And even as the authority of the Roman Empire in the East is crumbling with the campaigns of Khosrau II into Syria and into Egypt, and even attacking Constantinople itself, this is all taking place within this broader monophysite controversy. And given the existence of the Copts in Egypt, the Syriac church in Syria, and the Ethiopian oriental tradition, which is still the most prominent Christian church within Ethiopia today. Do you think it's interesting to see Armenia as part of this broader process of a Christian rebellion against the center of imperial power? Well, the story of what happened at the Council of Chalcedon and the detachment of the Armenian church from the Christian church is quite interesting. And there are so many threads to this story. Um, of course, in 451, this was long after 428, where 
where the last Arsacid king had been finally deposed and replaced with just a governor. So Armenia, as a sort of kingdom, had collapsed as a united nation, you could say. Um, and remember, in the fourth century, a lot of these Armenian kings had had trouble with the church. They had had a serious conflict with the church due to the influence of Arianism. Armenia was quite involved in the Arian controversy as well. So King Pap was, in fact, an Arian. If you read the account of the historian Faustus of Byzantium, Pavstos Byzant, he has a very colorful description of King Pap, uh, where he has demons coming out of his chest and thing, um, other things of that nature. Uh, and this is partially due to him being Arian, right, rather than Orthodox, like the Armenian church was at the time. So there had always been this religious conflict within Armenia, especially in the time of the Arsacid kingdom, where you had th these clashes between the, the king and the church. And of course, at the same time, you have a significant chunk of the people and the nobility who were still uh, pagan, right? I, I like to use the term Armenian paganism rather than Zoroastrianism because it was, it seems to have been rather syncretic mm. in, in terms of its tradition, though there are different viewpoints of that. Um, and then, of course, in the fifth century, a lot of these conflicts remain essentially. That's, uh, sorry, good day. Yes. Could I just, um, I think, add a caveat? Yes. yes. Um, I think it's fair to say absolutely that there are syncretic elements regarding Zoroastrianism. Um, especially, I believe, with Ahura Mazda and his place within the Ar the Armenian sort of pantheon. However, I, I just wanted to sort of put in place really that I, when I say Zoroastrianism, I'm not trying to imply that it's a uniform process, a uniform religion, in the sense I'm trying to almost distinguish it between local elements. I'm, no, I'm not making this clear. Local elements of Zoroastrian particularism, syncretism paganism in Armenia compared to what you can say is the centrally directed Zoroastrianism from the Sasanian Empire, which is aiming at persecuting Christians. Does that sort of make sense? Right, absolutely. I think that's a very good clarification. And, you know, it's a, it's a very, I think you can agree, it's a very complex situation, both politically, in terms of the society, in terms of the nobility, being split not only on political lines, but also on religious lines. You could perhaps say cultural lines as well, to a degree. Um, and of course, this all leads up to 451, where you have the Council of uh, Chalcedon. And of course, at that time, Armenia is embroiled in a war with the Sasanians. You have the Armenian Christian nobility led by the Sparabet, or the Generalissimo of Armenia, uh, Vartan Mamigonian, up against the Sasanian interest, the Sasanian Empire, and the sort of Zoroastrian, or not only Zoroastrian, but Persian loyal nobility led by the governor, who was of the Sunid dynasty, which of course would remain a prominent dynasty until the, you could say, the 13th, 14th centuries, the Ilkhanate period. Um, and in the middle of this political and religious conflict in Armenia, you have the Council of Chalcedon, where the Armenians are not able to send a proper delegation uh, due to being involved in this war. And of course, a letter was sent with the results, the conclusions of the Council of Chalcedon, and the Armenian translation was actually so poor that they had thought that the church had converted to Nestorianism. Mm -hmm. So following that misunderstanding, so essentially to monophysitism, following that, a better translation was sent properly. And even after reading the proper translation, the Armenian church disagreed. Perhaps th there was some influence of the previous miscommunication there. But the Armenian church still did not agree with the conclusions. And that's, of course, when the official split occurred. Mm 
Um, I hope that sort of gives a context to your question there. No, I, I think it does. I also think, because we're two hours into this um, conversation, and I think this is a good position really to end, because what good day you've been fantastic, thank you, in terms of helping establishing, I think, that despite all the calamities we see befalling Armenia throughout its first 1,200 years of existence, statehood, before we talk about proto-Armenia and Aratu, Armenia has been able to survive politically up until this point, up until the late 4th and 5th centuries AD. And nevertheless, this occurs at a time where we're seeing a creation of the Armenian script and a distinct Armenian Christian tradition, distinct from that of the more Hellenic tradition in the Eastern Roman Empire, which despite the division and the subjugation nominally of Armenia to a greater extent than there has been at any point during this time period, Armenia is just sort of, if anything, beginning to grow as a nation in terms of its self-awareness and in terms of its distinct cultural identity vis-a-vis -vis that of its neighbors. So Armenia survives and it will endure throughout the next hundred years. And what I'm trying to set up is that over the course of the next 300 years at least, Armenia will be nominally under the control of the Sasanians and later the Umayyads and the Abbasids. And this should try and go some way as to explain how Armenia was able to survive this. And when it does reconsolidate under Ashot in the year 885, it is a, as a united people, more or less corresponding to this original territory on the Armenian plateau that we established at the beginning. So I think what I'm going to do now, because I do think that's a good time to end this conversation and we can leave antiquity there, we can go into medieval Armenia perhaps at some other time, is because Marcus unfortunately has been having some internet issues. Marcus, do you have any general points or any other points regarding anything either of us have brought up to end this conversation? Uh, not necessarily, but I, like I said, I've, I've had a bit of a problem with disconnecting reconnecting like just router issue this morning sadly so i've not been as active as i'd normally be um suffice to say i did catch a question that you had asked me and then you got good to ask it because i wasn't able to answer so are you able to reiterate that question or do you remember what it was or, or yes exactly my my original question is focusing this idea of armenian nationalism being in some part a response to this idea of roman later byzantine betrayal which is going to be an issue which comes up again when we talk about the dissolution of the Bagratid dynasty. Mm, I, don't, I, don't, I see where you're coming from, but I think it's more of a case of the fact that it's um, Armenia has, from the from the time it, uh, shall I say, exerted a sense of independence and self sovereignty. Um, you know, it is. It has been this at times a strong, and at other times a less strong uh, kingdom throughout this period. But it finds itself quite firmly wedged between what are essentially the two superpowers of, of its day. You know, I, I, I hate to use modern analogies because they're often clunky. But it'd be, you know, to be sort of a middling European power wedged between, um, you know, Cold War Soviet Union and, and Cold War United States of America. Um, that's what it was kind of like for uh, uh, an Armenia to be stuck between uh, particularly less so Parthia, but certainly in the case of a more militarized and a more offensively minded Sassanid empire. And of course with, with Rome, um, you know, albeit potentially waning at some point, you know, for, for throughout the crisis of third century and confronting an increasing number of difficulties and and as history proved what ended up becoming sort of this precipitating and eventually terminal decline but it's still a powerful entity nonetheless um i think it was armenia's ability to sort of unshackle itself from being or, or a desire to be necessarily tied at the hip of either of these empires and attempting to be a legitimate sort of self-sovereign entity in that strategic context you know again i'm not trying to necessarily apply modern 
notions of geopolitics to it. But I think from what little I know, and I mean, I think someone like Gudi is in a far better place to comment on it from the Armenian perspective than I am. But certainly just as someone outside looking and as someone who has, you know, studied, you know, you know Byzantine campaigns in this in this time period or even you know knowledge of roman warfare um you know the and that the armenians themselves having had you know a, a a sense of 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 unity and identity amongst themselves that they were able to often raise marcus oh dear oh hello right at the critical point <laughs> <laughs> hello can you hear me yes hello. could you repeat the uh the uh, culmination of your point there marcus sorry we didn't hear it i uh, can where was i when i broke off uh, you were talking about the byzant your knowledge of um byzantine oh, campaigns. Y- y- yes so so you know i'm i'm obviously aware of these and i sort of you know and in in so far that we talk about say campaigns in the east or the roman persian wars which is a almost stream unto itself you know the armenians actually do play a sizable part in this they're not just some token you know two-bit force that you know it's not like we're trying to talk about i mean it's probably even unfair to call the achaeans or the um or the uh, aetolians to be token but you know armenia in this context is actually an important um consideration for either the romans or the sassanids you know you know generals and emperors in in constantinople or in tessaphon had to uh consider armenia as a part of their calculus regarding war both against their main dare i say cold war adversary or against armenia itself so i think um i think for them being able to uh, create a basis for independent strength and then exerting that insofar they are able within their sphere was important so just that answers your question absolutely just building on a couple of points so it's significant to understand that as antiquity is now transitioning into the medieval period Armenia alone is one of these states which is able to retain its position as a regional power, whilst other states, say for example Cappadocia, Osrhone, Sophene, are being dissolved or amalgamated into the other empires that surround it. Armenia, in the sense, is unique in the sense that it survives, albeit through the careful selection of its overall overlord in the sense of which client nation it's going to belong to. However, I just want to emphasize that we began this conversation by talking about the Chiropoda and Tigran and various solution, allusions to the Mesopotamian influence, Hurrian, Iratian, and then of course the direct Achaemenid link to the Orontids and the original dynasty. And you can say the confirmation of that dynastic link to Persia with the Arsacid ascension in the final centuries of the independent state of Armenia, together with a unique brand of Armenian Zoroastrianism fused with elements of Armenian paganism. At the same time, we see a cultural gravitation towards Syria in the form of Syriac Christianity at a time where Rome is also becoming steadily Christianized, albeit this is presaged by the Diocletianic persecutions before the Edict of Milan when Constantine established himself in power. Thereafter, Armenia draws culturally and intellectually to the West, to Rome and to Syria in the form of Christianity and through the alphabet. And yet the reason I brought up this idea of Roman betrayal was because Armenia is not just establishing itself as independent vis-a-vis the Persians and gravitating towards Rome. With Chalcedon, we're seeing a definitive split between Eastern Rome and Armenia itself. So Armenia is declaring its independence against both nations. And despite being physically dissolved, the nation of Armenia is culturally separated from both. And this is why I believe it's so significant to talk about the unique case of Armenia in history. So that's really what I have to say in summation, as opposed to the relevance of Armenia to the history of antiquity. But Gudea, as our expert for this conversation, would you like to offer any concluding points or perhaps uh dispute anything that i have to say so far no i think uh, that was an excellent summary an excellent way to view this essentially thousand years of history that we talked about uh from you know the achaemenid uh period all the way to the end essentially of the kingdom 428 i think um 
you know, what you said, how you have this cultural flourishing at a time when there's political turmoil. This is something that is echoed throughout Armenian history, all the way to the 14th century AD, when you have uh, the kingdom of Kiliki in Armenia slowly being eaten up by its neighbors. But that's the time when you get the most uh, culture, right? The, the miniatures of artists like Toros Roslin, the illuminated manuscripts, the historical texts, that's when you see the culture start to sort of blossom in those times. And I think that's what we see here at the end, at the period of late antiquity, the end of the Arsakid period when royal power, central power is waning, right? And the kings have to turn to soft power to solve their problems rather than ascending in the army to fight the Sassanid Empire, right? Which was becoming less and less possible as the years went on. So I think that's a very good way to sort of end this conversation. The, may I answer just a quick question, AM, before we sort of get to housekeeping? Because um, I, I just saw something in the chat I wanted to attend to, if that's all right. Sure. Yeah, someone made a point where I talked about Armenian forces and the fact that they were attractive to, you know, either to be recruited as mercenaries or incorporated as allies, you know, amongst the Archimedes or the Diadochi or even the Romans um, sort of throughout the classical period. I mean, what that person said, if I remember the question correctly, yes, other groups of people in this broad area were also famous, particularly for their use of cavalry. For instance, you know, we know the, the Thessaly and or Macedonian companions and uh, uh, uh Cappadocian cavalry obviously comes up frequently. Um, have you guys lost me? Am I still here? No, I can still hear you. Okay, no, sorry, I just got a disconnection thing again. My apologies. Um, yeah, you know, Bactrian cavalry, um, I believe, at, I think it's a Gorgamela. I think um, uh, Darius even recruits um, cavalry like from the far eastern periphery of the Persian Empire, like, you know, Gudrosia, uh, sort of on the border with the Indus, essentially. But the point I'm trying to make is that Armenian cavalry is, is sort of starts to accrue its um, its fame or certainly its um, its uh, popularity at this time, and then if you fast forward, what amounts to essentially you know fourteen hundred years later, fifteen hundred years later, you're sort of into the early part of the Crusader period. And pardon if I butcher the word Gudia, but you still have Armenian Nakharas, you know, mounted nobles who sort of fight in this hybrid fashion between the way you know byzantine the sort of roman cataphractoid method of fighting and then the western knight as you know would be best um exemplified by said the normans and the franks and the um you know uh, knights who would come from italy or the holy roman em empire you know they were still doing this 1500 years later they could be removed 10 or 15 generations from the men who fought um at gorgamela or fought you know um in the very early roman Parthian Wars. So that tradition is very enduring and very long standing. And that's the point I was trying to make is that be, that fame starts, you know, in the Achaemenid era and goes all the way to the end of the Crusader period. It's not something to be ignored in a military standpoint, uh, from a military context. There is just uh, on that note, though, I mentioned a possible equivalent between Armenia and Switzerland and the fact that it dominates a mountainous highland. Why mm. do you think the Armenians, I mean, you could say the same also about the, um, the Persians because Iran is quite similar in terms of topography. Why do the Armenians have such excellent cavalry given the terrain? Uh, Gudea might be better qualified in terms of local knowledge than me, but from what I understand, I mean, we talk about um, Armenian highlands but unless I'm mistaken, because I, I, I must admit to not having seen a topographical map of Anatolia for some time. But you know, we 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 know of the we know of the um, the the reasons, for instance, why why the Seljuks were so and the Turks were so easily able to trend, you know, uh, set up shop essentially in Anatolia, you know, after that migratory period, you know, from the south, the southern part of the Caspian Sea, you know, through the Zagros Mountains and into sort of the, the underbelly of Anatolia, let's say, that the Turkmen 
basically found a second home in Anatolia because the Anatolian plateau um, in some ways resembled that eastern step that they were from. Um, and, and I mean, for anyone who's traveled there, which I actually have traveled through parts of Anatolia, you can tell that, you know, once you're on the flat ground in the plains, not every, every bit of it is nice. You know, for instance, like if you go around Ankara, it's less than say around Konya or, or, or perhaps, you know, what we would consider to be modern day Bithynia or Southern Paphlagonia is actually sort of quite nice on the approach to Ankara. You know, these are areas where, uh, running animals and, and a pastoral sort of environment even amongst hunt uh, you know amongst sort of migrant uh, nomads like the turks are was perfectly feasible in fact it was prosperous if anyone who understands that sort of uh byzantine revival period sort of under the, the macedonian dynasty you know a lot of these larger states were found in anatolia that you know, bred horses and from which they raised soldiers that um you know came from the theme system which we've talked about in the actual greek byzantine stream uh, armenia we call it the armenian plateau it's sort of like a semi um like a smaller representation of that it's not as large or as expansive as sort of inner anatolia but there's still a plateau and so far as you have access to water and good pastures and grasslands that kind of topography and geography is exceptionally good for raising cavalry and i think that's also why on one hand you have this strong propensity for and an enduring legacy of of powerful well-trained very capable armenian cavalry it's perfect breeding ground for their horses and secondly it's also why as an aside from their horses you know uh, there's a term that comes into use from about oh, i'm gonna guess about the eighth century we call akritai which is sort of like these semi-irregular semi-professional soldiers that are sort of raised on the frontier and um and sort of supplement the the theme the thematic forces and a lot of these akritai are actually ethnic armenians or or they're sort of like interbred greeks and armenians who fight in this way and and they're very resourceful in infantrymen who can fight in difficult terrain so there's this sort of bipolar military um uh culture essentially in 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 armenia that on one hand produces these very hardy useful relatively well disciplined irregular border sort of soldiers uh, you know frontier soldiers almost like limes uh, limitani if we can use the roman word and then on the other hand they produce excellent excellent um sort of medium and even sort of heavy cavalry as well i, I would just, i would put down for that just to just to reinforce your point marcus i mean look at this map it should be important that physical armenia is bounded by three major lakes um lake uh, sevan uh, Lake Van and Lake Omiya, albeit that sort of crossing over a bit into uh, Azerbaijan, Iran. Um, mm -hmm. And your comment about the Seljuks being able to create a sort of nomad, semi nomadic empire in the central sort of Anatolian plateau mm -hmm. um, has its equivalent with the Turkoman tribes of the Black Horse, of the Black Sheep, and the White Sheep. Oh, who, so the the, the Karakulunu and the um the Al Kulunu, Kulunu, yes, yeah. who later, of course, are renowned in Safavid tradition as the Kizilbach or the yes. red-headed Turkmens, who yes. also come from this period and also represent the fact that the Azerbaijani nation, um, sort of really as a Turkish nation within sort of Iranian influence, as opposed to the Ottoman mm. Turkish <clears throat> uh, mm. people, sort of comes into the fore at this point as well, and of course will cause issues for the Armenians up until this day. Mm. <coughs> uh, but just, yes. good day, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think um, Marcus made an excellent point about the strength of that military tradition with the cavalry because when we look at when the mongols are sweeping down into uh, iraq or mesopotamia and syria there are uh, thousands of armenian cavalry alongside them and with georgian auxiliaries as well and uh, even and there were armenian cavalry fighting for the georgian crown at the same time there were heavy armenian cavalry fighting for uh, Kiliki and Armenia, the Armenian kingdom of the 12th to 14th centuries AD based in Kilikia. So that's, and that's of course, you know, thousands of years after uh, they're, after they um, uh, 
fought at Gaugamelad. So that's a really incredible, incredibly long and strong military tradition. Fantastic. Just to emphasize incredible sort of Armenian endurance yet again. So on to Super Chats. Uh, Pelinor White Strake for nine pounds. Thank you very much. Hello, popping in to wish you well. Would you consider doing an episode on favorite historical movies or shows, even historical fiction? We'd love to see you talk more about Fall of Eagles or Claudius. Well, as for Fall of Eagles, I've done something explicitly history related a while ago, which focuses on Blessed Charles, Wilhelm II, and Nicholas II. However, that's been behind a paywall for some time. You need to be on equestrian tier to be able to access that. As for Fall of Eagles itself, the series, um, I would love to be able to revisit it with Marcus because I know that's one of his favorite series to such an extent that he and I are often quoting it at each other. Uh, I do not deny this accusation. <laughs> yes, uh, and I have, I have many reasons to talk about it, not just historically, but also from the point of view of documentary making as well. Um, Mm. It would serve as an interesting discussion. Um, I'm not sure quite what the method would be, but absolutely impossibly soon. As for I, Claudius, again, Columbo would be perfect for that, knowing his uh, affinity for Robert Graves, and also it would give us an opportunity to talk about Tacitus um, as well. Um, so possibly, again, very much. Um, but it could also be I, Claudius, the book, as much as it's I, Claudius, the 1970s TV show. So... Um, Fantastic. Mombasa Timmy for three, four, nine New Zealand dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, would you stream on the Dominicans, Jesuits and the Franciscans? As for the Jesuits, there was a segue about that, which I did on a lecture called the Tridentine Era. If you want to check that out, albeit it wasn't nearly as exhaustive as it could have been. As for a general stream on religious orders um i'm not sure i'm far more interested in doing a survey of the Jes of a survey of the jesuits post 1815 and why the jesuits failed that would be a far more interesting topic for conversation i think than focusing on the others um then again it might be very spicy and it might offend a lot of people then again i don't care <laughs> um absolutely so thank you mabasa to me okay that's it for the super chats so thank you very much before we go Gadea, you'll be a fantastic guest is there anything you would like to say before we go no just a thank you for inviting me on I, I know it was on short notice but i hope i was able to um explain myself well and uh, yeah thanks again for having me on the show no it's absolutely fantastic to have you on and i have linked in the description his YouTube channel regarding history and his YouTube channel regarding Total War. So please do check him out on YouTube. Furious, is there anything you would like to say before we go? Uh, no, aside from the fact that, um, as we sort of said at the top of the show, I, I, I didn't even realize this was necessarily on the cards because I know you, you're an extremely busy man with a lot that you wish to stream about and a lot that we have to do. We've just completed, obviously, na Nations of Charlemagne and we still are, we're yet to just get. Uh, you know, finish off, uh, you know, uh, orthodoxy, autocracy, nationalism, which which has been a wonderful series. But the moment I saw this, uh, this, uh, you know, this YouTube pilot, I knew that uh, our friend here, Gudia, was the perfect man for it because it's not often that we we sort of uh, you you might say see um, Armenians in our in these sort of spheres and talking about these things. And I think, um, and like I've always said, and I said, I, I think I've said this to you before, even is that, you know, it's kind of ironic when people will talk about, oh, you know, is is East Rome actually Rome or it's not? And, you know, there's a panel full of everyone except like a Greeks or Italians who probably should be talking about that because they have a vested interest in it. And, you know, um, I kind of feel this way about Armenia. You know, it's, it's Armenia is hugely interesting and I myself don't know a lot about Armenia, but I, it, it's it's a country that, you know, has a, a, a tragic history, sadly, but also... An, an amazing history and an enduring history and it, and it d does deserve its um you know it, it's it's dues in that respect it, it deserves its um its place to be talked about and to be shared amongst people who would otherwise be interested and not know about it and um and our friend here Gudir was the perfect man on and I'm glad we arranged this because I think it it gave this topic 
the justice it deserves. And I look forward to part two, uh, um, and I'm hoping we do it at some point soon. It'd be wonderful to, you know, do this uh, canvas this topic in a, in a in a justified and a comprehensive way. So thank you, of course, AM as always, and of yes. course the. Th thank you very much, Marcus. Just for relevant streams regarding that. On September 5th, there will be a discussion on the final Ottoman imperial century, which doesn't actually end at the end of the Ottoman Empire. It ends in 1911 uh, uh, for reasons of my own sort of organization of history. Um, but of course, that will focus seg in at one segment on the Armenians, and that will, of course, be revisited in the penultimate episode of Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality where we will go over the Armenian genocide. But nevertheless, it doesn't help to have a dedicated part two to cover all of this as well, around about the same time, where we can no doubt cover it in more detail. So anyway, thank you to everyone for watching. Thank you to my two wonderful guests for making this possible. And good night. Good night, everyone.